The Personal History of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Mrs. David Copperfield? Yes? Miss Trotwood, your late husband's aunt. You have heard of her, I dare say? I... I have had that pleasure. Now you see her. Yes. Please, uh, come in. Will you come in here, Miss Trotwood? There is a fire. Thank you. Don't do that. Come, come. Take off your cap and let me see you. Why, bless my heart, you're a baby. I'm afraid I was but a childish widow. And I'll be but a childish mother. If I live. Why rookery in the name of heaven? Do you mean the house, ma'am? Mm. The name was Mr Copperfield's choice. When he bought the house, he liked to think that there were rooks about it. And where are the birds? Well, there haven't been any since we lived here. We thought it was a rookery, but the nests were very old ones. David Copperfield all over. Takes the birds on trust because he sees the nests. Mr Copperfield is dead. If you dare to speak unkindly of him... <laughs> Come, child. Sit down. You've gone pale. There. When do you expect? I can't stop trembling. I don't know what's the matter. I shall die. No, you won't. <gasps> Have some tea. What, what do you call your girl? I don't know if it will be a girl. Oh, bless the baby, I don't mean that. I mean your servant girl. Peggotty. <sighs> do you mean to say that any human being has gone into a Christian church and got herself named Peggotty? It's her surname. Mr Copperfield called her by it because her Christian name is the same as mine. Here. Peggotty. Tea. Your mistress is unwell. Don't dawdle. You were speaking about it being a girl. I have no doubt it will be a girl. Now, child, from the birth of this girl... Oh, perhaps, boy. I have a presentiment that it must be a girl. Oh, Don't boy. contradict. From the moment of this girl's birth, I intend to be her friend. I will be her godmother. And I want you to call her Betsy Trotwood Copperfield. There must be no mistakes in life with this Betsy Trotwood. There must be no trifling with her affections, poor dear. She must be well guarded from reposing any foolish confidences where they are not deserved. I shall make that my care. Was David good to you, child? We were very happy. Mr Copperfield was too good to me. <laughs> he spoilt you, I suppose. For being quite alone in this rough world. Yes, he did. <sighs> poor baby. Do you know anything? I beg your pardon, ma'am. About keeping house, for instance. Not much, I fear. But Mr Copperfield was teaching me. Much he knew about it himself. I hope I should have improved. But the great misfortune of his death. <gasps> oh. I kept my housekeeping book regularly and balanced it with Mr Copperfield every night. Oh, well, well, don't cry any more. I'm sure we never had a word of difference about it, except when Mr Copperfield objected to my threes and fives being too much like each other and to my putting curly tails to my sevens and nines. You'll make yourself ill, and that won't be good for you or for my goddaughter. Ow! Oh, what's this? Good heavens, you shall be upstairs in bed. Oh! Peggotty, oh. see to your mistress. She needs you. <gasps> yes, ma'am. There, Mrs. Copperfield, there. Oh. Come here with me. I think that's time to fetch Dr. Chillip. And so, to begin my life with the beginning of my life, I was born, as I've been informed and believe, on a Friday at 12 o'clock at night. It was remarked that the clock began to strike and I began to cry simultaneously. Well, Mom, I am happy to congratulate you. How is she? 
Well, ma'am, she will soon be quite comfortable, I hope. <laughs> quite as comfortable as we can expect a young mother to be under the melancholy domestic circumstances. And she, how is she? Uh, ma'am? The baby, how is she? <laughs> ma'am, <laughs> I apprehended you had known. It's a boy. Mom? My aunt walked out and never came back. She had vanished like a discontented fairy. The first objects I recall when I look back to my childhood are my mother with her pretty hair and youthful shape, and Peggotty with no shape at all, and cheeks and arms so hard and red that I wondered that birds didn't peck at her in preference to apples. What else do I remember? Let me see. I remember the quiet churchyard I could see from my bedroom window. The churchyard where my father's white gravestone lay. I felt sorry for it, lying all alone in the dark night, while our little parlour was warm and bright with fire and candle. I remember reading stories to Peggotty by that parlour fire. She would sit there sewing sometimes touching me with a forefinger so rough it felt like a nutmeg grater. I thought her beautiful. The mother crocodile comes out of the water to lay her eggs in the sand so that the warmth of the sun may hatch them. I remember one particular night very well. When her babies are born... I'd been reading to her from a book about crocodiles. My mother was spending the evening at a neighbour's and we were all alone. Peggotty, are you listening? Yes, Master Davy. Oh, drop that there cotton. That don't match. Go on, do. Master Davy, what is it? Peggotty. Yes, my dear. I was wondering, were you ever married? Lord, Master Davy, what made you ask that? But were you ever married? You're a very handsome woman, aren't you? <laughs> Me handsome, Davy? Lord, no, my dear. <laughs> What's put marriage into your head? You mustn't marry more than one person at a time, must you, Peggotty? Certainly not. But if you marry a person and the person dies, why then you may marry another person, mayn't you, Peggotty? You may if you choose, my dear. That's a matter of opinion. But what is your opinion, Peggotty? My opinion is that I was never married myself and that I don't expect to be. That's all I know about the subject. You ain't cross, Peggotty, are you? Cross? Why, bless the child, no. No, do you let me hear some more about the crocodiles? For I ain't heard half enough. Oh, that be your mother come home. Mama? Davy? Davy, darling? Oh. oh, you're more highly privileged than a monarch, my little man. What does that mean? Why, Davy, that's rude to Mr. Murdstone when he's been kind enough to bring me home. No, no, he's protecting you. I don't wonder at his devotion. Come, David, let's say good night and be the best friends in the world. Shake hands, my boy. Davy, that's the wrong hand. <laughs> Let go of mine. No! Never mind, he's a brave little fellow. Good night, ma'am. Good night. I hope you had a pleasant evening, Mum. Much obliged to you, Peggotty. I had a very pleasant evening. Come, Davy. <sighs> yes, Mama. Why, my darling, you're half asleep. Come into the parlour by the fire. A stranger or so makes an agreeable change. A very agreeable change indeed, Peggotty. Not such a one as this, Mr. Copperfield, wouldn't have liked. That I say and that I swear. Oh, good heavens, you'll drive me mad. Was any poor girl so ill-used by her servants as I am? Oh, have I never been married, Peggotty? God, no, you have, ma'am. Then how can you dare... 
You know I don't mean how can you dare, Peggotty. But how can you have the heart to say such bitter things to me when you know that I haven't a single friend to turn to? The more's the reason for saying that won't do. How can you go on as if all were settled and arranged when I tell you over and over again that beyond the commonest civilities, nothing has passed? That may be. What am I to do? Do you want me to shave my head and black my face? I dare say you do, Peggotty. I dare say you'd quite enjoy it. No, ma'am. And my own dear boy, my own little Davy, is it to be hinted to me that I'm wanting in my affection for my precious treasure? Nobody never went and hinted no such thing. You did, Peggotty. You know you did. Am I a naughty mamma to you, Davy? No, mamma. Am I a nasty, cruel, selfish, bad mamma? No, indeed. <gasps> Say yes, my child, and Peggotty will love you. And Peggotty's love is a great deal better than mine, oh. Davy. I don't love you at all, oh. do I? Yes, Mama. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and so we all went to bed greatly dejected. In the next weeks, I became used to seeing Mr. Murdstone about our house. He had beautiful black hair and whiskers, but I didn't like him. Peggotty was less with us of an evening than she had always been, and we were less comfortable among ourselves. One day, Mr. Murdstone decided to take me with him to Lowestoft, where he was meeting a friend who was there with a yacht. We went to an hotel by the sea, where a gentleman was waiting for us on the terrace. He was sitting at a little table, smoking a cigar and drinking sherry. Hello, Murdstone. I thought you were dead. Not yet, indeed. And who's this shaver? That's Davy. Davy who? Jones? Copperfield. What? Bewitching Mrs. Copperfield's encumbrance? Pretty little widow? Quinion. Hmm? Take care, if you please. Somebody's shop. Who is? Only Brooks of Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and what is the opinion of... Brooks of Sheffield about the projected business. Well, I don't know that Brooks understands much about it at present, but he is not generally favourable, I believe. Never mind. We'll drink to him. Murdstone. Thank you. This young gentleman will take a little sherry too, my boy. Thank you, sir. Now I want you to give the toast. Yes, sir. Say after me, confusion to Brooks of Sheffield. Confusion to Brooks of Sheffield. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Brooks of, of Sheffield. Sheffield. <laughs> what was it they said, Davy? Tell me again. I can't believe it. Bewitching. <gasps> it was never bewitching. Yes, it was. Bewitching Mrs. Copperfield. <gasps> and pretty. No. No, it was never pretty. Yes, it was. <gasps> Not pretty. Pretty little widow. <gasps> What foolish, impudent creatures. Oh, Davy, dear, don't tell Peggotty. She might be angry with them. I am dreadfully angry with them myself, but I would rather Peggotty didn't know. Promise you won't tell her. I promise. Master Davy? Yes, Peggotty? How should you like to go along with me and spend a fortnight at my brother's at Yarmouth? Wouldn't that be a treat? Is your brother an agreeable man, Peggotty? Oh, what an agreeable man he is. Then there's the sea, and the boats, and ships, and the fishermen, and the beach, and my nephew Ham to play with. But what will Mother say? Well, I'll ask her as soon as she comes home. And I'll as good as bet the guinea that she'll let us go. But what's she to do while we're gone? She can't live by herself. Oh, bless you. Don't you know? She said... She's going to stay for a fortnight with Mrs. Graper. It touches me nearly now to recollect how eager I was to leave my happy home. How little I suspected what I was to leave forever. Mr. Marcus, stop! Stop! Whoop! David, dearest, one more kiss for your mamma. Goodbye, my precious. Oh, mamma! Clara! Clara! I'm coming. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye. Cheer up. The carrier's cart moved away, taking Peggotty and me with it. We left my mother standing in the road. Mr. Murdstone was with her, and he seemed to reproach her for being so moved. I wondered what business it was of his. 
When we first saw Yarmouth, I felt disappointed. It looked rather spongy and soppy, and so flat, I couldn't help wondering if the world was really as round as my geography book said, how any part of it came to be so flat. But as we came into the town, I saw the streets were full of sailors and carts jingling over the stones, and they smelt of fish and pitch and tar. I liked it much better then. Ham, over here. Right, you heads, Clara. Ham's come to meet his master, Davy. Ham's your nephew. That's right. Oh, ho, ho. you go to bits since the last saw you, sir. Come, you on, sir. Up my shoulders with you. There you go, Davy. Up we go. Ham had a boy's face, but he was a huge, strong well, fellow, well, six well, foot well. high, and he swung me onto his shoulders with no trouble at all. We went through the town till we came out upon a wilderness of sea and sand and sky, with nothing to break the horizon but an old black barge, high and dry on the ground, with a smoking iron funnel sticking out of it. Yon's our house, Master Davy. Where? That ship-looking thing. That's it. If it had been Aladdin's palace, I couldn't have been more delighted. Certainly, I might have thought it small and inconvenient if it had been a house. Its charm lay in its being a real boat, which had never been intended to be lived in on dry land. Evening, Clara. How we are? Evening, young sir. Good evening. We were welcomed by a very civil woman in a white apron and a large hairy man with a good-natured face, who gave Peggotty a smacking kiss. From the general propriety of her conduct, I concluded he must be her brother. And so he was. That's good. And this is Master Davy, oh. my brother Dan or Davy. Glad to see you, sir. You find us rough, but you find us ready. Thank you, Mr. Peggotty. Mm. I'm sure I'll be very happy here. And how's your ma, sir? Did you leave her pretty jolly? Yes, very jolly. Mm. She, she sent you her compliments. Oh, I'm much obliged to her, I'm sure. Well, sir, I hope you can make out with us for a fortnight, along with... Clara, Ham, and, and little Emily here. Come you here, my little love. Mm -hmm. Say hello to Master Davy. No. Huh? Oh. No. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, sir. She, she don't mean no disrespect. She's a shy one, is our Emily. I think I was disappointed. For little Emily was the most beautiful little girl I'd ever seen. But I forgot that when I saw my bedroom, in the stern of the vessel, with a little window where the rudder used to go through, and a patchwork counterpane that made my eyes ache with its brightness. It's like a ship's cabin. <laughs> oh, Peggotty, it's lovely. I thought that's how you'd like it. It was altogether a delightful house. Not less delightful to me, because everything smelt of fish. We dined sumptuously off boiled dabs, melted butter, and potatoes with a chop for me. Afterwards, when Mr. Peggotty was smoking his pipe, I felt it was time for conversation and confidence. <sighs> Mr. Peggotty? Mm, yes, sir. Did you give your son the name of Ham because you lived in a sort of ark? No, sir. I never give him no name. Who gave him that name, then? Why, sir, his father gave it him. I thought you were his father. Oh. My brother Joe were his father. Dead, Mr. Peggotty. Drowned dead. But little Emily, mm. she's your daughter, isn't she? No, sir. My brother-in-law, Tom, were her father. Dead, Mr. Peggotty. <sighs> Drowned dead. Haven't you any children, Mr. Peggotty? No, master. I'm a, a bachelor. A bachelor? Mm-hmm. Then who's that lady? <laughs> that's Mrs. Gummidge. Master Davy, that's getting late. You must be tired. Come you on, no bedtime. <laughs> there now. Let's get you tucked in tight. There. All right. You see, Ham and Emily were both left orphans, Master Davy. Two little children with no one as could care for them. My brother adopted them at different times. And Mrs. Gummidge? Did your brother adopt her too? Well, in a way. She's the widow of his partner. He died very poor, did Mr Gummidge. 
My brother's a poor man himself, mind, but he's good as gold and true as steel. And kind, looks, Master Davy, I only ever seed him lose his temper when someone thank him or tell him how good he is. Then he'll swear he'll be gormed if he won't cut and run for good if anyone ever mentions it again. What's gormed? Well, I don't rightly know, Master Davy. But that's a very strong manner of speech. Very strong. The following day was bright and sunny. I went out with little Emily, who'd got over her shyness, and we walked along the beach, picking up stones and looking at the sea and the sailing boats. I'm afraid of the sea. I've seen it very cruel to some of our men. I've seen it tear a boat as big as a house all to pieces. I hope it wasn't about that your father... That, that father was drowned and... No, not that one. I never see that near a boat. Nor him? No, not to remember. I never saw my father. My mother and I have always lived by ourselves. Oh. We're very happy. We'll always live just by ourselves. My father's buried in the churchyard. My father ain't got a grave. He were lost at sea. And my mother's dead too. Besides, your father was a gentleman. And your mother's a lady. And my father was a fisherman. And my mother was a fisherman's daughter. And my uncle Dan is a fisherman. Dan is Mr. Peggotty, is he? Yes. He must be very good. <laughs> oh, if I was ever to be a lady, I'd give him a sky blue coat with diamond buttons. Nankin trousers, a red velvet waistcoat, a cocked hat, a light gold watch, a silver pipe and a box of money. Would you like to be a lady? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I'd like it very much. We'd all be gentlefolk together then. Me, an uncle, Ham and Mrs Gummidge. We wouldn't mind the storms then, not for ourselves. But we would for the poor fishermen. We'd help them with money if they came to any harm. Do you think you are afraid of the sea now? No. You don't seem to be afraid of it. You walk so close to it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it in this way. But I wake when it blow and tremble to think of Uncle Dan and Ham and believe I hear him crying for help. <laughs> I'm not a bit afraid in this way. <laughs> Look! <laughs> she ran down the jetty and out along a jagged timber that protruded from it and overhung the deep water at some height without the least defence. Emily, come back! <laughs> Emily, Emily! She soon turned and came back safe to me and I laughed at my fears. <laughs> Are you frightened me? There have been times since, in my manhood, when I have pictured again little Emily as I saw her that day, standing on the edge of her destruction, looking far out to sea. We strolled a long way, put some stranded starfish back into the water. I don't know whether they'd have thanked us for it or not, and then made our way home. Davy? Yes? Would you like to kiss me? Yes, please. <laughs> of course, I was in love with little Emily. I'm sure I love that baby quite as tenderly as in the best loves of a later time of life. I made a very angel of that blue-eyed mite, and if she'd spread a little pair of wings and flown away before my eyes, I don't think I'd have been surprised. In the boat, I soon found out that poor Mrs. Gummidge did not always make herself as agreeable as she might have done. Oh, it's cold. Very cold. It certainly is cold. Everybody must feel it so. Oh, I feel it more than other people. That's late. That was late. Not so very late. Uh, he's gone to the willing mind. I know he has. I knew this morning he'd go there. Ah, well, mates, and how are you all? Hey, Donald. Uh, 
Oh, cheer up, old Maul or what's a mess? Nothing, Dad. <sighs> you come from the Willing Mind. Oh, yes, I've took a short spell at the Willing Mind tonight. Are you sorry I should drive you there? Drive? I don't need no driving. I go only too ready. Oh, very ready, yeah, very ready. I'm sorry that you should be so ready along of me. Along of you? Didn't long of you? Don't you believe a bit on it? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Oh. I know what I am. I know that I'm a lone, lone creature, and not only that everything goes contrary with me, but that I go contrary with everybody. No. Yes. Wow. Yes. I feel more than other people do, and I show it more. That's my misfortune. I'll go contrary. No such thing. Now, cheer up, old gal. I am what I could wish myself to be. I'm far from it. I know what I am. My troubles has made me contrary. I wish I didn't feel them, but I do. I wish I could be hardened to him, but I can't. Oh, I'll make the house uncomfortable. I don't wonder at it. I've made your sister so all day, and Master Davy. No, you haven't, Mrs Gummidge. Well, that's far from right that I should do it. And a fair return. I'd better go into the house and die. Oh. I'm a lone, lone creature, and much better not make myself contrary here. Yeah. If things must go contrary with me, and I must go contrary myself, let me go contrary in me parish. That all. I'll be better go into the poor house and, and die and, and be a riddance. <laughs> She's been thinking of the old one. The old one? Mr. Gummidge. Whenever Mrs. Gummidge was overcome in a similar manner during the remainder of our stay, which happened several times, Mr. Peggotty said the same thing to excuse her, and always with the tenderest commiseration. So the fortnight slipped away, and at last the day came for going home. I was greatly overcome at parting from little Emily, but as the carrier's cart drew nearer home, I got very excited and couldn't wait to get there and run into my mother's arms. Whoa! We're home! Oh, Peggotty, we're home! Mama! Where's my mother? Peggotty, isn't she come home? Yes. Yes, Master Davy, she's come home. Why hasn't she come to the door? Oh, Peggotty, she's not dead. No! Peggotty, what's happened? You see, dear, I should have told you afore, but I couldn't exactly bring my mind to it. Mas Davy, what do you think? You have got a pa, a new one. A new one? Yes, do come and see him. I don't want to see him. And your mama, come. They're there, in the parlour. Go you in, Davy. Davy, Davy, dear. My Claire, my love, recollect, control yourself. <laughs> Uh, David, my boy, how do you do? After a moment, I went and kissed my mother. Davy. She kissed me gently and sat down to her embroidery. I could not look at her. I could not look at him. As soon as I could creep away, I crept upstairs. My old dear bedroom was changed, and I was to lie a long way off. I rolled myself up in the counterpane and wept. There he is, Mum. Davy! <coughs> Davy, what's the matter? <coughs> Peggotty, this is your doing. How could you? How could you turn my own boy against me? Against anybody dear to me? What do you mean by it, you cruel thing? Lord, forgive you, Mrs. Copperfield. Of what you have said this minute, may you never be truly sorry. On my honeymoon, too. When you think my worst enemy might relent and not envy me a little peace of mind and happiness. Oh, dear, what a troublesome world this is, when one has most right to expect it to be as agreeable as possible. What's this? Clara, my love, have you forgotten? Firmness, my dear. 
I'm very sorry, Edward. I meant to be firm, but I'm so uncomfortable. Indeed. Well, that's bad hearing so soon. I say it's very hard I should be made so now. It is very hard, isn't it? Go below, my love. Yes, Edward. David and I will come down together. Yes, Edward. My friend, do you know your mistress's name? She's been my mistress a long time, sir. I ought to know it. That's true. But I thought I heard you, as I came upstairs, address her by a name that is not hers. She has taken mine, you know. Will you remember that? Sir? David, if I have an obstinate horse or dog to deal with, what do you think I do? I don't know. I beat him. I make him wince and smart. I say to myself, I'll conquer the fellow, and if it were to cost him all the blood he had, I should do it. What's that mark on your face? Dirt. Dirt? You have a good deal of intelligence for a little fellow. I see you understand me very well. <laughs> Wash that face and come down. He knew as well as I that it was the mark of tears, but my baby heart would have burst before I told him so. A word of encouragement, of pity, of welcome home, of reassurance to me that it was home, might have made me dutiful to him in my heart, and might have made me respect instead of hate him. After dinner, a coach drove up to the garden gate, and he went out to receive the visitor. Jane, I hope you're well. I am very well, thank you, Edward. My mother followed him, and very timidly, I went after her. Clara is anxious to welcome you. Davy, Davy, my darling, you must love your new father, and you must be a good, obedient boy. Clara. Mm. You are well, I trust. Very well, thank you, Jane. Is that your boy, sister-in-law? Yes. This is Davy. Generally speaking, I don't like boys. How do you do, boy? Very well. I hope you are. Hmm. Wants manner. Now, Edward, may I see my room? Upstairs, Jane. I trust you had a comfortable... You journey. must be very polite to Miss Murdstone, Davy. Miss Murdstone? Is she? She is Mr. Murdstone's sister. It seemed that Miss Murdstone had come to stay with us for good. A gloomy-looking lady she was, dark like a brother whom she greatly resembled. She had a hard steel purse, kept in a very jail of a bag, which hung on her arm by a heavy chain and shut up like a bite. And she was embellished with numerous little steel fetters and rivets in the place of softer adornments. I have never in my life seen such a metallic lady. Every morning she was up at Cockcrow. She took over the running of the household and demanded the keys on the pretext that my mother was far too pretty and thoughtless to have any duties imposed on her. Yes, Jane. That seems to be in order. Thank you. I'm glad you approve my accounts, Edward. Uh, one other matter. With your approval, I shall take our custom to another butcher. This man's prices are far too high. Do as you think fit, Jane. <laughs> what is this? I do think I might be consulted. Claire, I wonder at you. Oh, it's very well to say you wonder, Edward, but you wouldn't like it yourself. It's very hard that in my own house I... My own house? Our own house, I mean. Edward, it is very hard that in, in your own house I may not have a word to say about domestic matters. I'm sure I managed very well before we were married. Ask Peggotty. Edward, let there be an end of this. I go tomorrow. Jane Murdstone, be silent. I don't want anybody to go. I'd be very miserable if anybody was to go. I don't ask much. I only want to be consulted sometimes as a mere form. I'm sure I'm very much obliged to anybody that assists me. I thought you were pleased once, Edward, at my being inexperienced and girlish. But you seem to hate me for it now. You're so severe. Edward, I go tomorrow. Jane Murdstone, be silent. Clara, you astound me. 
Yes. I had a satisfaction in marrying an inexperienced and artless person and forming her character, infusing into it some of the firmness and decision of which it stood in need. But when Jane Murdstone is kind enough to assist me in this endeavour and assume for my sake a condition very like that of a housekeeper, and when she meets with a base return... Oh, Edward, don't accuse me of being ungrateful. I have many faults, but not that. Oh, don't, my dear. When Jane Murdstone meets, I say, with a base return, that feeling of mine is chilled and altered. Oh, don't, my love, I can't bear to hear this. Weakness can have no weight with me. You lose breath. Oh, I couldn't live under coldness and unkindness. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have my defects, and it's very good of you to correct them for me. Jane, I don't object to anything. I should be broken-hearted if you thought of leaving. Jane Murdstone, oh. harsh words between us are uncommon. Oh. It is not my fault that they have occurred tonight, nor is it your fault. Oh. We were both betrayed into them by another. Oh. Let us forget it. This is not a fit scene for the boy. David, go to bed. From that day, my mother never gave an opinion on anything without first appealing to Miss Murdstone. There had been some talk of my going to boarding school, but nothing had been concluded. In the meantime, I learned at home. I remember one terrible morning. I went into the parlour and found my mother looking anxious, Miss Murdstone looking firm, and Mr Murdstone binding something round the bottom of a cane. Ah, that will do. Oh, Edward! Good morning, David. Good morning, sir. I tell you, Clara, I have often been flogged myself. To be sure. But, Jane, do you think it did Edward any good? Do you think it did Edward any harm, Clara? That's the point. Oh, certainly, my dear Jane. Now, David, you must be far more careful today. Your tables, Davy, dear. Let us start with the twice times table. Two times one... No, Clara. He must know the simpler tables by now. The twelve times table. Very well, Edward. Davy. Twelve times one is twelve. Twelve times two is twenty-four. Twelve times three is thirty-six. Twelve times four. Twelve times four. Oh, Davy, Davy. Not Clara. Be firm with the boy. Don't say, oh, Davy, Davy, that's childish. He knows his tables, or he does not know them. He does not know them. Davy, try just once more, and don't be stupid. Twelve times one is twelve. Twelve times two is twenty-four. Twelve times three... Twelve times three... Thirty-six. Clara! He does not know his tables. Put the book aside. Now, David, pay attention. If I go into a cheesemonger's shop and buy 5,006 double Gloucester cheeses at fourpence halfpenny each, what must I pay? David? Uh, I... The boy's an imbecile. Oh, Davy. Clara! I'm not quite well, my dear Jane. Why, Jane... We can hardly expect Clara to bear with perfect firmness the worrying and torment David has occasioned her today. We cannot expect so much from her. David, you and I will go upstairs. Oh, Edward, no! Clara, are you a perfect fool? Oh, sir, sir, pray don't beat me! Quiet, boy! I have tried to learn... Have you, David? We'll see. No, sir, please. Oh, don't beat me, sir. Please don't beat me. It was only a moment I stopped him, for he cut me heavily an instant ah. afterwards. Ah. And in the Ooh. same instant, I caught the hand with which he held me between my teeth and bit it through. You wicked, obdurate boy. Ah. 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 He beat me then, ah. as if he would have beaten me ah. to death. He was gone. The door was locked. And I was lying fevered and hurt and torn, raging upon the floor. It grew dark. 
Miss Murdstone came in with a tray on which were bread and milk and meat. She put it down, glaring at me, went out and shut and locked the door again. My imprisonment lasted five days. Those five days in my remembrance seem like years. Davy? Davy, dear? Peggy, where are you? Outside. Hush, or the cat will hear us. How's Mama, Peggy? Is she very angry with me? No. No, no. Not very. What's to be done with me, Peggy, dear? Do you know? Um, school. Near London. Oh, when? Tomorrow. Shall I? Shall I see Mama? Yes, you will, Davy. Tomorrow morning. Davy, dear. Yes, Peggy. If I haven't been exactly as intimate with you as I used to be, it ain't because I don't love you. That's because I thought it better for you. And for someone else, besides. Oh, Peggy. Oh, my own. What I mean to say is, you must never forget me. For I'll never forget you. And I'll take as much care of your mama as ever I took of you. The day may come when she'll be glad to lay her poor head on her stupid, cross old Peggotty's arm again. From that night, I felt something for Peggotty I cannot very well define. She didn't replace my mother. No one could do that. But she came into a vacancy in my heart, which closed upon her, and I felt towards her something I've never felt for any other human being. The following morning, Miss Murdstone brought me my breakfast and then took me down to the parlour, where I ran into my mother's Mama, arms. Mama, Mama, I'm so sorry. Oh, Davy, that you could hurt anyone I love. Try to be better. Pray to be better. I forgive you, but I'm so grieved, Davy, that you should have such bad passions in your heart. Clara, the carrier is waiting. Davy, you're going for your own good. I forgive you, my dear boy. God bless you. Clara. Mama. Don't dawdle, boy. I hope you repent before you come to a bad end. Stop! Mr. Vargas! Stop! Whoa! Oh, oh. Davy, my darling. The cart wouldn't let me come out to see you leave. But I slipped away and ran to catch you here. Take these cakes, my love. You'll be hungry. And here's money from your mama and me. Dear Peggotty. Goodbye, my treasure. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Mark. Are you going all the way, Mr. Marcus? All the way where? There. Mm. Where's there? Near London. Why, that there horse will be deader than pork before he got over half the ground. Are you only going to Yarmouth, then? That's about it. And there I shall take you to the stagecoach. And the stagecoach shall take you to wherever it is. Thank you, Mr. Barkis. Would you like a cake? Oh. Thank you. Oh. Did she make them now? Do you mean Peggy, sir? Ah. Hair. Yes. She makes all our pastry and does all our cooking. Do she, though? Oh. No sweethearts, I believe. Oh, no. She never had a sweetheart. Did she, though? So, she make all the apple pasties. Oh. Does all the cooking, do she? Yes. Well. I tell you what. Perhaps you'll be writing to her. Oh, yes, I will. I shall write straight away when I get to Yarmouth. Oh. Well, if you're writing to her, perhaps you'd recollect to say that Barkis is willing. Would you? That Barkis is willing. Is that all the message? Yes. Yes. Marcus is willing. Remember, Marcus is willing.
My dear Peggotty, I have come here safe. Barkis is willing. My love to Mama, yours affectionately, Davy. P.S. He says he particularly wants you to know Barkis is willing. Is there anybody here for a youngster? Booked in the name of uh, Murstone from Blunderstone, Suffolk. To be left or called for? Uh, try Copperfield, if you please, sir. Uh, is, is there anybody here for a youngster? Booked in the name of Murdstone from Blunderstone, Suffolk, but answering to the name of Copperfield. To be left or called for? Uh, come. Is there anybody? <laughs> Better give him a brass collar and tie him up in the stable. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody claimed me. I sat in the booking office, looking at the parcels and packages, and wondering if Mr. Murdstone had devised this plan to get rid of me, and if he had, what I could do. I thought I might try to enlist as a soldier or sailor, but I was only eight years old, so perhaps they wouldn't take me. However, the problem did not arise. For at last, a gaunt young man in need of a shave came into the office and whispered to the clerk, who pushed me over to him as if I were weighed, bought, delivered and paid for. We walked out of the office, hand in hand. So you're the new boy? Yes, sir. I'm one of the masters at Salem House. Is it far? It's down by Blackheath. We'll go by the stagecoach. It's about six miles. If you please, sir. I'm very hungry. Why, oh, then you must have breakfast. I have to call on an old lady near here. We'll buy some food and she'll cook it for you. That's right, young sir. Thank you. Eat it all. It'll do you good. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, my boy. Yes? Have you got your flute with you? Yes, I have. Oh, whoever blow at it, do. While a young gentleman's having his breakfast. Oh, it's delicious! Oh, go on, Charlie. After many years of consideration, my impression is there can never have been anybody in the world who played worse. But the old woman was so delighted, she gave him an affectionate squeeze round the neck, and this oh, mercifully Charlie. stopped him playing. <laughs> However, my breakfast really was delicious, and I enjoyed it even in the dismal surroundings of the almshouse cottage. At last, the master at Salem House, whose name I found was Mr. Mel, although the old lady called him my Charlie, took me to catch the coach for Blackheath, where I fell asleep. Salem House was a square brick building with wings, very bare and unfurnished, and quite empty because it was holiday time. I had been sent there early as a punishment. The schoolroom was the most forlorn and desolate place I have ever seen. Suddenly, I came on a placard, beautifully written, lying on a desk. It said, Take care of him. He bites. Sir? Yes? Where's the dog? What dog? That's to be taken care of, sir. That bites. That's not a dog, Copperfield. That's a boy. My instructions are to put this placard on your back. Oh, sir. I'm sorry to make such a beginning with you, but I must do it. He tied the placard on me like a knapsack, and I was still wearing it, deeply ashamed, when I was summoned to see the headmaster, Mr. Creakle. So, this is a young gentleman whose teeth are to be filed. Turn round. Sir. Take care of him. He bites. Good. Come here, boy. Yes, sir. I have the happiness of knowing your stepfather. And a worthy man he is, and a man of strong character. He knows me, and I know him. Do you know me? Hey. Not yet, sir. You will soon. I tell you what I am. I am a tartar. When I say a thing, I do it. When I say I will have a thing done, I will have it done. 
My flesh and blood, when it rises against me, is not my flesh and blood. I discard it. Now, you've begun to know me, my young friend. And you I go. If you please, sir. Uh, what? What's this? Sir, I'm very sorry indeed for what I did. If I might be allowed to take this writing off before the boys come back. Ah. Oh, sir! But even facing the headmaster was not as terrible to me as facing my fellow pupils with that placard on my back. Hello. Are you the new boy? Yes. What's your name? David Copperfield. What's your name? Look, up here. The gate with all the names carved on it. Yes. Mine's in the right-hand corner. Over the top bolt. See? Mm. Traddles. That's right. Tommy Traddles. What's that on your back? I say, look here. Sample. See what Copperfield's got on his back. <laughs> <laughs> he bites. Down, sir. Down, Towser. <laughs> <laughs> on the whole although it cost me a few tears in private. It wasn't as bad as I'd expected. They laughed, but they laughed at it, not at me. One name was carved many times on the playground gate, and carved very deeply. It was J. Steerforth. Before this boy, who was at least half a dozen years my senior and very good-looking, I was carried as before a magistrate. Steerforth, this is the new boy. The new boy, hey? What's your name? David Copperfield, sir. Welcome to Salem House, David Copperfield. What's that on your back? Turn round. Yes, sir. Take care of him, he bites. <laughs> Be quiet. What does it mean, Copperfield? My stepfather. He made them put it on me. He was beating me, you see, and I bit him. Yes, I see well, young Copperfield, I think it's a jolly shame. From that day, I became bound to steer forth forever afterwards, and no one in the school dared to laugh at me again. Later that day, Steerforth paid me the compliment of walking with me in the playground. I was conscious of the honour done to me, and the envy of the other boys. What money have you got, Copperfield? Six shillings. You'd better give it to me to take care of. At least you can if you like. You needn't if you don't like. Here you are, sir. Perhaps you'd like to spend a couple of shillings or so on a bottle of currant wine by and by, up in the bedroom. You belong to my bedroom, I find. Yes, I should like that. Good. And another shilling or so on biscuits, and another on fruit. Well... I say, young Copperfield, you're going it. Well, we must make it stretch all we can. I can go out when I like, and I'll smuggle the prog in. That night, Steerforth sat on my pillow handing out the viands to us all, and dispensing the current wine. A certain mysterious feeling, consequent on the darkness, the secrecy, and the whisper in which everything was said, steals over me again as I look back. Give me the matches. Here, sir. Ah, here's the wine. <gasps> it's very dark. <laughs> look! Oh, Lord! Look over there! What is it? In the corner, the headless man! <laughs> <laughs> Quiet, Traddles. It's all right, John Copperfield. Just Traddles' nonsense. <laughs> Have you met our esteemed headmaster yet, Copperfield? Oh, yes. Don't shiver. He isn't here. But he never lays a hand on you, Steerforth. I'd like to see him try. Oh, well, that's all the current wine. Time we all went to bed. Good night, John Copperfield. I'll take care of you. You're very kind to me. You haven't got a sister, have you? No. That's a pity. If you had one, I should think she'd have been a pretty, timid, little bright-eyed sort of a girl. I should have liked to know her. Good night, young Copperfield. Good night, sir. I thought of him very much after I went to bed and raised myself to look at him where he lay in the moonlight with his handsome face turned up and his head reclining easily on his arm. He was a person of great power in my eyes, but no veiled future dimly glanced upon him in the moonbeams. <laughs> oh, Mr. Crackle. Oh, shh. No, 
Now, boys, this is a new term. Take care what you're about. Come fresh up to lessons, for I come fresh up to the punishment. The marks I shall give you won't rub out, uh, however hard you rub them. Now, get to work, every one of you. <clears throat> Copperfield. Sir? You're famous for biting, but I'm famous for biting too. What's that? It's a cane, sir. No, Copperfield. It's a tooth. Is it a sharp tooth? Hey! Does it bite? Hey! Do you hear me, Copperfield? Does it bite? I was soon in tears, but I was not alone. Half the school was crying before the day's work began. Steerforth had continued his protection of me and proved a useful ally, since nobody dared to annoy anyone he honoured with his friendship. For my part, I admired him very much and felt a great pride and satisfaction when an accidental circumstance enabled me to be of service to him. Copperfield. Copperfield. Yes, dear Forth. You're not asleep then. Good. You usually sleep well enough. I don't. Not often. That book you were talking about today, what was it called? What book, sir? Some novel. You said Travers reminded you of the hero. Roderick Random. That was it. A novel by... who was it? Tobias Smollett. We've got all his books at home. Smollett, yes. Have you got any of them with you? No. Can you remember them? Oh, yes. I know them all very well. And I think I've got a good memory. Then I tell you what. You shall tell them to me. I told you, I can't get to sleep at night, and I wake early. We'll make a regular Arabian Nights of it, and you can start with Roderick Random. And so Roderick offered to stay in the West Indies, uh, and was made surgeon's mate on board the Lizard Man of War. <laughs> Come on, young Copperfield. You're half asleep. We'll have the rest another time. Thank you, Steerforth. <sighs> you could go to sleep in class tomorrow morning if you cared to. It's only old Mel. And nobody minds him. Why? Why don't they mind him? Because he's a poor thing. He was very kind to me in the holidays. And he met me when my coach arrived in London. And looked after me. Looked after you? How? He took me to a place where an old lady cooked breakfast for me. <laughs> that was uncommonly kind of her. A friend of Mel's, was she? I suppose so. She called him My Charlie. Did she indeed? What sort of place was it? A little cottage. One of a lot of cottages. There was a stone over the gate. It said... They were established for 25 poor women. <laughs> well, you know who she was, don't you? No. Mel's mother. Mel's mother, living on charity. I don't suppose Creakle knows about it. Silence! This is impossible! How can you do this, boys? <laughs> Silence, Mr. Steerforth. Silence yourself. Whom are you talking to? Sit down. Sit down yourself and mind your business. If you think I don't know the power you can establish over any mind here, or that I haven't seen you urging your juniors on to every sort of outrage against me, you're mistaken. I don't give myself the trouble of thinking about you at all. So I'm not mistaken. And when you use your position of favouritism here to insult a gentleman... Oh, what? Where is he? Shame, Jay Steerforth. Too bad. Be quiet, Traddles. To insult one who is not fortunate in life and who never gave you the least offence when you were old enough and wise enough to know the many reasons for not insulting him. 
when you do this, I say you commit a mean and base action. Mr. Mel, once for all, when you take the liberty of calling me mean and base, you're an impudent beggar. You're always a beggar, you know. But when you do that, you're an impudent beggar. Stinnivore! <laughs> Mr. Mel. Sir? You have not forgotten yourself, I hope. No, sir. And Mr. Steerforth. Sir? What is this? What did he mean by talking about favourites? Favourites? Who talked about favourites? He did. Pray, what did you mean by that, sir? I meant, Mr. Creakle, that no pupil has a right to avail himself of his position of favouritism to degrade me. He said I was mean. And then he said I was base, and then I called him a beggar. I am surprised you should attach such an epithet to anyone employed at Salem House. <laughs> That's not an answer, sir. Let him deny it. Deny that he's a beggar. If he's not a beggar himself, his near relation is one. His mother lives on charity in an almshouse. Now you hear what this gentleman says, Mr. Mel. Have the goodness to set him right. He is right, sir. What he says is true. Indeed. Yes. You know my worldly circumstances are not good. You know what my position is here. I know that you've been in a wrong position altogether and mistook this for a charity school. Mr. Mel will part, if you please. The sooner, the better. There's no time like the present. Sir, to you. I take my leave of you, Mr. Creakle, and all of you. James Steerforth, the best wish I can leave you is that you may come to be ashamed of what you've done today. Mm-hmm. Steerforth. You have asserted the independence and respectability of Salem House. Let me shake your hand. Sir. Uh, Thomas Traddles, come here. Uh, What is this nonsense? Now you really have something to cry about. Boys, get on with your work. What are you blubbing for, Travels? I'm glad you caught it. I don't care. Mr. Mo is ill-used. Who ill-used him, you girl? Why, you did. What have I done? What have you done? Hurt his feelings and lost him his situation. His feelings? They'll soon get the better of it. They're not like your feelings, Miss Travels. <laughs> As for his situation, do you suppose I'm not going to ride home and take care he gets some money, Polly? I remember we all thought this very noble of Steerforth, whose mother was a rich widow, reputed to do almost anything he asked her. One afternoon a few weeks later, I was summoned to the dining room and told I had visitors. I went there feeling very nervous. I could only think of Mr. and Miss Murdstone. But when I opened the door, I saw two very different faces. Why, Mr. Peggotty and Ham. Master Davy. Master Davy, boy. Oh, you've grown. <laughs> Am I grown? Oh, grown, Master Davy? And he grown. Do you know how Mama is? <laughs> and my dear old Peggotty. Oh, she's uncommon, common. And mm. Mrs. Gummidge and little Emily. Uncommon. We, uh, we brought these here for you, Master Davy. Mm. Shrimps. Oh, thank you. Uh, and a lobster or two. No one as how you was partial to a little relish with your victuals when you was along at us. <laughs> the, the old mother biled them, she did. Hmm? Thank you, Mr. Peggotty. Hmm? And please thank Mrs. Gummidge. Oh, that I will, sir. I suppose little Emily's grown now, since I saw her. She is getting to be a woman. That's what she's getting to be. Her pretty face, her larning, her writing, why, that's black as jet, and so large it is you might see it anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here, young Copperfield. Don't go, Steerforth, <clears throat> if you please. 
These are two Yarmouth boatmen, mm -hmm. very kind, good people, relations of my nurse, who've come from Gravesend to see me. Aye, aye. I'm glad to see them. How are you both? Uncommon, sir. You must let them know at home, if you please, Mr. Peggotty, that Mr. Steerforth is very kind to me. And that I don't know what I should do here without him. <laughs> Nonsense. You mustn't tell them anything of the sort. And if Mr. Steerforth ever comes into Norfolk or Suffolk, I shall bring him to Yarmouth, if he lets me, to see your house. It's made out of a boat, Steerforth. Made out of a boat, is it? Uh -huh. That's the right sort of house for such a thorough-built boatman. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, sir. So it is. The young gentleman's right, a thorough-built boatman. That's what he is. <laughs> I, I, I thank you, sir. Uh, I, I do uh, my endeavours in my line of life, sir. <laughs> the best of us can do no more, Mr. Peggotty. I'll pound it, sir. That's what you do yourself, and what you do right well. Uh, now, uh, my house and mine, sir... Uh, but there's hearty at your service if you should come along with uh, Master Davy to see it. I wish you both well, and I wish you happy. We parted from them in the warmest fashion. They had opened their hearts to steer forth. Indeed, there was an ease in his manner and a charm in his voice and his handsome face that carried a kind of enchantment with it that few people could resist. At last, the holidays came, and the Yarmouth coach and then Mr. Barkus, the carrier, taking me home again. Get up there! You look very well, Mr. Barkus. <clears throat> I gave your message. I did write to Peggotty. What? Wasn't that right? Why, no. Not the message? The message was right in our France. But it come to an end there. Nothing come of it. There was an answer expected, was there? When a man says he's willing, there's as much as to say that that there man's a waiting for an answer. Well, Mr. Barkis? Well, that there man's been a waiting for an answer ever since. Have you told her so, Mr. Barkis? No. We ain't got no call to go and tell her so. We'll never say six words to her myself. Would you like me to do it? You might tell her, if you would, that Barkis is a waiting for an answer. What's her name? Peggotty. Christian name or natural name? Oh, it's not her Christian name. Her Christian name is Clara. Is it, though? Oh. See here. Or we'll write it on the cart. Clara... Peggotty. Well, says you, Peggotty, Barkis is a waiting for an answer. Says she perhaps answer to what? Says you to what I told you. What is that, says she? Barkis is willing, says you. Cheer! Soon I was at our house, where the bare old elm trees wrung their many hands in the bleak wintry air and strands of the old rook's nests drifted away upon the wind. I went in with a quiet, timid step. It was my mother's voice. I think I must have lain in her arms and heard her singing to me when I was a baby. It filled my heart brimful, like a friend come back after a long absence. Love slumbers not watching She was sitting by the fire, suckling an infant whose tiny hand she held against her neck. Her eyes were looking down upon its face. Mama! Davy! My dearest Davy! My own boy! She kissed me and laid my, my head down on her breast Davey. near the little creature that was nestling there and put its hand to my lips. He is your brother, Davy, my pretty boy, my poor child. I wish I had died then with that feeling in my heart. I should have been more fit for heaven than I have ever been since. 
It seemed that Mr. and Miss Murdstone had gone out on a visit and would not return before night. We dined together by the fireside, Peggotty, my mother and I, as if the old days were come back. Peggotty, I've got a message for you hmm? from Mr. Barkis. <laughs> from Barkis, Master Davy? Yes. He asked me to tell you again. Barkis is willing. Oh, no, he never did no such thing. Yes, he did. He said, Barkis is willing. <laughs> Peggotty, you ridiculous thing. What's the matter? <laughs> Drat the man. He want to marry me. Barkis want to marry me. <laughs> it would be a very good match for you, perhaps. I wouldn't have him if he were made of gold, nor I wouldn't have nobody. <laughs> Will you tell him so? Well, he never said a word to me about it. He know better. If he were to make so bold to say a word to me, I should slap his face. <laughs> So you're not going to be married, Peggotty, dear? Oh, Lord bless you, no, ma'am. Don't leave me, Peggotty. Stay with me. It may not be for long. Me leave you, my precious. Not for all the world and his wife. Why, what's put that in your silly little head? I'll stay with you till I'm a cross, cranky old woman. And when I'm too deaf and too mumbly for want of teeth to be any use at all... Then I shall go to my Davy and ask him to take me in. And I'll make you as welcome as a queen. <laughs> Bless you, dear. I know you will. Come, my baby. Mm -hmm. oh. I wonder what's become of Davy's great aunt. Miss Trotwood? Is that who you mean, Peggotty? Yes, Master Davy. Your aunt, Betsy Trotwood. I wonder if she'd die, whether she'd leave Davy anything. Oh, good gracious, Peggotty. You know she took offence at poor Davy's being born at all. Oh, she might favour him more now. Now he's got a brother. Peggotty! As if this poor little innocent in his cradle ever did you any harm. You'd better go and marry Mr Barkis. Oh, I'd make Miss Murdstone happy if I was to. You know she only does what she does out of kindness and the best intentions. Yeah, there's too much of the best intentions going on. When you talk of Mr Murdstone's good intentions... No, I you... never talked of them. You must know how good his intentions are. If he seems to have been at all stern with a certain person, it's for a certain person's own good. Huh. He loves a certain person on my account. And he takes great pains with me, and I ought to be very thankful to him. Well, that's as may be. Oh, Peggotty, don't let us fall out, for I couldn't bear it. You are my true friend, oh. if I have any in the world. Fall out, my pretty. Peggotty will never fall out with you. I'd like to see her try, eh, Davy? I felt that evening as though the old days were back. I crept close to my mother's side and sat as I used to, with my arms round her and my cheek on her shoulder. I felt her beautiful hair drooping over me like an angel's wing and was very happy indeed. Even then I saw that she was changed. Her face was very pretty still, but it was careworn and delicate. And her hand was so thin and white, it seemed almost transparent. But I was too young to wonder what the reason for this change might be. Next morning, I had to meet the Murdstones again. And the happy time was over. Davy, dear. I beg your pardon, sir. I'm very sorry for what I did, and I hope you will forgive me. I'm glad to hear you're sorry, David. Dear me, how long are the holidays? A month, ma'am. Counting from when? From today, ma'am. Oh, then here's one day off. <laughs> Mama? Yes, Davy? Can I hold my baby brother just for a moment? Why, take him, dearest. Oh, he's so tiny. Yes. Oh! Good heavens, Clara! See? See what, my dear Jane? He's got it. The boy has got the baby. Come here. Oh. Quiet. Quiet. You're with me now. Oh. Oh. oh, I feel quite faint. Take him, Clara. 
Boy, never do that again. You must never touch the baby. No doubt you're right, my dear Jane. David, where are you going? I was going to talk to Peggotty. You will stay here. Oh. I'm sorry to observe you're of a sullen disposition. As sulky as a bear. Now, David, a sullen, obdurate disposition is of all tempers the worst. And of all such dispositions I've ever seen, this boy's is the most stubborn. Oh, even you must see it, Clara. I, I beg your pardon, my dear Jane, but are you quite sure... Oh, forgive me. But are you quite sure you understand, Davy? I should be ashamed of myself if I couldn't understand the boy, or any boy. Yes. I don't profess to be profound, but I do lay claim to common sense. I think, Clara, others may be better judges on such a question than you. Oh, Edward, you are a far better judge of all questions than I pretend to be. Both you and Jane are. I only said... You only said something weak and inconsiderate. Try not to do it again. I... David, I remarked that I was sorry to see you're of a sullen disposition. You must endeavour to change it. We must endeavour to change it for you. I beg your pardon, sir. I've never meant to be sullen since I came back. Don't and... take refuge in a lie, sir. You have withdrawn yourself to your own room when you ought to have been here. I require you to be here, and I require you to bring obedience here. I will have a respectful bearing towards myself and towards Jane Murdstone and towards your mother. I will not have this room shunned as though it were infected at the pleasure of a child. Sit down. Yes, sir. And one thing more. You are not to associate with servants. The kitchen will not improve you. Of the woman who abets you, I say nothing, since you, Clara, from old associations, have a weakness there which is not yet overcome. Oh, a most unaccountable delusion. Uh, David, I disapprove of your preferring Mistress Peggotty's company. Now you understand me. If you disobey me, you know the consequences. I knew them too well, and not just for myself. I took refuge with Peggotty no more, but sat wearily in the parlour day after day, looking forward to night and bedtime. So the holidays lagged away, until Miss Murdstone triumphantly pulled the last day off the calendar, and Mr. Barkis arrived to take me away. She up! As his cart moved off, I heard my mother calling to me. Goodbye, Davy! My child! She stood at the garden gate, holding her baby up in her arms for me to see. It was cold, still weather, and not a hair of her head, not a fold of her dress was stirred, as she looked intently at me, holding up her child. So I lost her. So I saw her afterwards in my sleep at school, a silent presence near my bed, holding her baby in her arms. David Copperfield, I have something to tell you. Yes, Mrs. Creakle? When you came away from home at the end of the holidays, were they all well? Was your mamma well? My mamma? Because I grieve to tell you that your mamma is very ill. She is very dangerously ill. She is dead. There was no need to tell me so. I knew already and felt an orphan in the wide world. I left Salem House the next day and travelled overnight to Yarmouth. A fat, short-winded, merry-looking little old man in black met me and took me to a shop that called itself Omer, draper, tailor, haberdasher and funeral furnisher. We went into a little back parlour where three young women were at work on a quantity of black crepe. Well, how'd you get on, Minnie? 
We'll be ready by the trying on time. Never you be afraid, Father. Oh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> when I got my breath back, I'll measure this here young scholar. Hmm? <laughs> ah, I've been acquainted with you a long time, my young friend. <laughs> Have you, sir? <laughs> All your life. <laughs> I may say, afore it. Hmm. I knew your father for you. Uh, he was five foot nine and a half, and he lay in five and twenty feet of ground. Do you know who my little brother is? He, uh, he's in his mother's arms. <coughs> oh, <laughs> never you mind it, Morn. You can help my boy. <coughs> yes, the baby's dead. <coughs> I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall not die, but have eternal life. I stood apart from the others, with Peggotty, that good and faithful servant, whom of all the people upon earth I loved the best, and under whom my childish heart was certain that the Lord would one day say, Well done. She was never well for a long time, Davy. When her baby were born, I thought she'd get better, but she sunk a little every day. I think she got more timid and more frightened, like. A hard word were like a blow to her. But she was always the same to me. It was my sweet girl. <laughs> How long was she very ill? Oh. The day you went away, she said to me, I never shall see my pretty darling again. Something tells me so. Ah. She tried to hold up after that. She never told her husband what she told me. Till one night, not long before the end, she said to him, My dear, I think I'm dying. Oh, I'm so tired, Peggotty. If this is sleep, sit by me while I sleep. Don't leave me. I'll never leave you. God bless both my children. God protect my fatherless boy. Peggotty. Yes, my dear. If my baby should die too... Oh, ma'am. If he should die, please let them lay him in my arms and bury us together. My dearest boy, go with us to our resting place and tell him that his mother, when she lay here, blessed him not once, but a thousand times. I will, ma'am. Oh, his father was so good to me. When I was very giddy and foolish, he told me a loving heart was better than wisdom. And he was happy in mine. Oh, put me nearer to you. Yes, my love. Lay your arm underneath my neck and turn me to you. Your face is going far off. I want it to be near. I want you near. <laughs> oh, Davy, my words come true. She were glad to lay her poor head on her stupid cross old Peggy's arm.
she died like a child, uh, gone to sleep. The first act of business Miss Murdstone performed when the funeral was over was to give Peggotty a month's notice. I dare say she'd have been happy if she could have given me a month's notice too. I wasn't sent back to school, but no attempt was made to give me any other education, and I was never disciplined or punished again. It seemed that all I had to fear now was neglect. Davy, dear, I've been thinking that perhaps as they don't want you here at present, they might let you go along of me. Oh, Peggotty, do you think they will? Oh, here, I'll ask her now. <coughs> uh, Ma'am, when my notice is up, I'm uh, thinking of going to stay with my brother at Yarmouth. I wondered as Master Davy might be let go with me for a week or two. Hmm. Well, the boy will be idle there, but to be sure he'll be idle here or anywhere, in my opinion. It is of more importance than anything else that my brother should not be disturbed. Ah, I suppose I'd better say yes. Cheer up! It's a beautiful day, Mr. Barkis. That ain't bad. Peggotty is quite comfortable now, Mr. Barkis. Is she, though? Are you pretty comfortable? <laughs> yes, Mr. Barkis. <laughs> really and truly, you know. Are you? <laughs> uh, really and truly, pretty comfortable. <laughs> are you? <laughs> uh, are you? Yeah. Oh, oh, Mr. Marcus, you're that close now, Master Dave's got no room. You don't want him to fall out, do you? Oh, ah. Ben, your pardon, Master Davy. <laughs> uh, but. You are pretty comfortable now, though, are you? <laughs> it was no use. He obviously thought he had hit on a way expedient for expressing himself in a neat, agreeable manner without the inconvenience of inventing conversation. At length, we arrived at Yarmouth, where Mr. Peggotty and Ham met us. Careful with the big trunk, that's got China. I'll take it. There we go. Goodbye, Mr. Barkis. Come in, Master Davy. Yes, Peggotty. Master Davy, here a minute. I say, that were all right. Oh, yes. That didn't come to an end there. That were all right. Was it? You know who was willing? That were Barkis and Barkis only. Yes. I'm a friend of yours. You made it all right. Come along, Davy. Goodbye, Mr. Barkis. You did it! You made that all right! <laughs> what were Mr. Barker saying to you? He said it was all right. Like his impudence. <laughs> but I don't mind that. David, dear, what should you say if I were to think of being married? Would you like me as much as you do now? Oh, of course I would, my darling. Tell me what you'd say. If you were thinking of being married to Mr. Barkis... Yes? I should think it would be a very good thing. <gasps> You'd always have the horse and cart to bring you over to see me, and you could come for nothing. The sense of the dear, what I've been thinking of this month back. I wouldn't give it another thought, though, if my Davy was anyways against it. Not if I'd been asked in church 30 times, three times over, and was wearing out the ring in my pocket. Peggotty, look at me. You can see I'm really glad. I truly wish it. Oh, bless you, my precious. And now, Master Davy, how's your friend, sir? Steerforth. That's the name. You said that was Rudderford. Well, you steer with a rudder, don't you, Ham? How was he, sir? He was very well indeed when I came away, Mr. Peggotty. Ah, there's a friend, if you think of friends. Why, Lord, love my heart alive if it turned a treat to look at him. Is he very handsome? Oh, indeed, he's very handsome, Emily. Isn't he, Mr. Peggotty? Handsome? He stands up to you like a... Well, I don't know what he don't stand up to you like. He's so bold. Yes, he's as brave as a lion. And I do suppose that in the way of book learning, he'd take the wind out of almost anything. 
He's very clever. And he's made a friend of me and taken me under his protection. Ah, no, there's a friend. Do you look at Emily? She's like me. She'd like to see him. Oh, come now. Hush. Indeed, Emily was listening very attentively. Her breath held and her blue eyes sparkling like jewels. But when I looked at her, she blushed and turned away. <laughs>